Next we're going to talk about the location of a data set. And location here, uh, we, we split up the locational aspects into data that are explicitly spatial and compare that to data that are implicitly spatial. So data in data that are explicitly spatial, the location of each observation is one of the variables of interest in our analysis. So we are actually going to store data about the location of each observation and the intention is to use that location information in our analysis. And there are two different ways that we can store data about, sorry, store location about, a da about an observation. The first is storing the absolute location, what we'll call first order location, of, of each observation. And with first order location or absolute location, for every observation we are storing some information about the, the location of that observation on the Earth's surface. So in geographic data, say we have locations of waterfalls uh, in the United States, for each of these waterfalls we are going to store some location data and that's often in the form of an XY coordinate. So the X and the Y coordinates are variables in our data set that are describing the location of each observation. And we're going to contrast that with relative location or second order location. And in relative location data, we are storing the locations of our, uh, of our observations with respect to locations of some other feature in the environment. So in this case, we might be storing for each waterfall not the absolute location of the waterfall, but perhaps we want to know how far away is this waterfall from a highway. So if this is our highway passing through our study area, for each location we might measure the distance of the location to the highway. So we're going to measure this distance and this distance and this distance is really small, this one's really small. And for each observation we're going to have a variable that's called distance to the highway. And and we, we use that kind of location information when we're trying to understand the role of location or distance in the process that we're studying using statistics. So we might want to use statistics in order to understand what is the impact of location on the amount of times a waterfall gets visited. So it might be the case if we had absolute location data that we were studying whether or not more western waterfalls are visited, or whether or not western wa waterfalls are visited more frequently than eastern waterfalls, then we can use the x-coordinate to see if the x-coordinate has an impact on visitation. But we might also want to know whether or not highway infrastructure plays a role in visiting waterfalls, in which case we would want to use the distance variable the distance variable to know whether or not larger distances means less visitation than smaller distances. So we are going to be, uh, in either of these cases we are storing explicit spatial information, but that type of information can be absolute or relative. And really, you know, all data that we collect are at least implicitly sp spatial. Nothing is really aspatial anymore. Everything that we collect has some kind of location associated with it. But with implicit, implicitly spatial data, um, each observation may have a spatial location, but we're not actually analyzing the role of location itself, and therefore we often don't need to collect data or, or have data about the location in our data set. So these data, like um, country level data, well, we know that the countries are implicitly spatial, that China is at a certain location and India is at a different location, but we're not actually storing any data about those locations, 
about the perimeters of the countries, about the centers, where the capital cities are. We're not really storing any of that spatial data. Metadata might also contain some information about how the data have been aggregated. Now, we are going to compare individual level data to spatially aggregated data. Individual level data is when each data value represents one observation in the data set. So we might have a census of households or persons, and we might have a data set that contains information about each individual person or household that we, con that we collected data about. And on the other hand, in many instances, while we might collect data about individual people or individual households, when we report that data set or make it available for secondary use, we often find that the data have to be aggregated into spatial units. So individual units are being aggregated into, uh, into zonal data, and the data values for the individual units are summarized and presented at the zonal level. A lot of you are aware of this type of data already. All of the census data that we are able to use or report on or see in the newspaper is aggregated data. The census will never release data about individual respondents to the survey because that violates privacy, uh, the privacy of those people filling out the survey. But what they will do is release a summary of data for all the people living within each census tract in a city. So rather than knowing my income and my, and my neighbor's income individually, they will look at my neighborhood, the census tract that I live in, and report on the average income level of the people living in that census tract. And we talk about different levels of aggregation. The census tract is quite a low level of aggregation. The, the spatial units are pretty small. Uh, but we could aggregate the data to higher levels, uh, uh, higher level zones as well. So depending on what you're trying to accomplish with your analysis, it might suffice to have data about individual cities, or we might have data on gun ownership at the county level, or this level of aggregation really could be something that's more environmental. So we might have uh, watershed level data where we have data for each watershed in the state or each national park in the country. We're going to talk more later about issues surrounding how we aggregate data and what that means for our analysis. The first issue that we are going to discuss is called the Modifiable Aerial Unit Problem, the MAUP. You'll hear me call this the MOPE all the time. And the MOPE occurs when aggregation influences the summary values and statistical analyses of our data set. So by summary values, we mean the way in which we aggregate our data will affect how we uh, will affect the value, the summary values of our data within the zones that we are uh, aggregating our data to. Also, when we aggregate data and then perform statistical analyses on that aggregated data, we might find that the results of our statistical analysis would differs depending on how we aggregated the data. So if we do an analysis on census tracts, it, the result that we get from that analysis might not be the same as if we were to do that analysis at the state level of aggregation. And this can occur for two reasons. We have the scale effect and the zone effect. So the scale effect has to do with the level of aggregation. So if we have a study area like this, if this is the study area and we have individual observations all over the study area, we can choose to aggregate this data into different numbers of zones. So we, could ha we can split it up into two zones and aggregate the data units within each of these two zones and report that. Or we can split it up into four zones. 
or we can split it up into eight zones and on and on and on so the level of aggregation how how big or small the zones are that's going to relate to what we call the scale effect and whether or not the results of our statistical analyses change based on scale uh, is something that we like to investigate in geographic analysis. The other type of effect is the zone effect and the zone effect has to do with the fact that while you know we can we can keep the scale of aggregation constant, but for any scale of aggregation, the zones in which we draw at that level of aggregation can change. They're arbitrary oftentimes. So if we erase this, okay, that's not erasing very well, but if we redraw this now, here are our observations. How many different ways can we split this data up into roughly four zones? Well, we can do it like this. We could have done it like one, one, two, three, four, like that. All right, we could have done it into four zones like this, one, two, three, four. We could have done it like this, one, two, three, four. So technically the scale of all of these different zoning systems are the same. Each zone has the same area, no matter how we split it up into four equal areas. And there's always going to be, there were four different zones in each of these ways that we divided the study area. But the result of our analysis will change depending on how we draw these these zonal boundaries. So that's going to be called the zone effect. And in this example to the left here, this is taken from the textbook that we're using, we have an example. So we have collected um, locations of where people live and whether or not those people are ill. So we've collected data about three individuals, one, two, three, those are their absolute locations, and the zero and one is um, whether or not the person was ill. So in this case, these two people were not ill, and this person was ill. And we see that in each case we are going to look at um, different, th these two different ways of aggregating the data set. So we're going to have region set A, the first way of aggregating the data, and region set B, the second way. Now when we have individual level data and we divide the data into different regions, like if we have this circular region and we put these two observations in one region, and we report data about the individuals, the fact that we've aggregated the data doesn't actually change the value of whether or not uh, this illness variable in our data set. So if we have individual level data before aggregation, this person was a zero, this person was a zero, this person was a one. If we put some s kind of regionalization on these three points, it doesn't matter. We're still reporting data about individual people. So this person is still a zero, this person is still a zero, this person is still a one. The only thing that we've done is we've added extra information that says, and this person is in this region while these two people are in this region. But we haven't modified at all or summarized the data pertaining to illness. When we aggregate the data, what we are going to do is give an average illness rate for the two different zones in our data set. So in this case, in this zone outside of the circle, we only had one observation and, there, and, and this person was not ill, so therefore the illness rate in this zone was 0%. And in the internal zone here, the illness rate was 50% because we had two people, one was ill, one was not. Now, if we had decided to split this data up into two zones, rather than using the circular zoning system, if we drew a line 
like this and separated the two data the the data set that way now when we take the average in this zone we're averaging across the two zeros the two zeros here and we see that the illness rate in this zone is 0% and the illness rate in this zone with only one observation and it's a sick person the illness rate here is 100% let's call let's call the outside zone zone 1 and the inside zone zone 2 so we've got zone 1 zone 2 and in regionalization A, so this one using the circle, in zone 1 we said the illness rate was 0, and in zone 2 the illness rate is 50 percent. In regionalization B, let's call the left zone zone 1, we have 0 percent again for zone 1, but on the right hand side we have 100 percent. So you'll see that the way in which we've split this data set up into zones really impacts the values that we get for our analysis. We also have to make students aware of something called the ecological fallacy, which occurs when one makes an inference about individuals based on aggregated data. For example, if we have a data set about average household income across different states and the data set says that the average household income in Utah is forty five thousand dollars we would be committing an ecological f fallacy if we were to assume that any households within the state of Utah actually earns forty five thousand dollars so just because the state level income is forty five thousand dollars doesn't actually mean that there's any individual households within the state earning that amount of money. It could be that we have half of the households in the state earning maybe zero dollars and the other half earning ninety thousand dollars. So here's zero, here's ninety thousand. So if we have half the population over here earning zero and half earning ninety thousand, the average is still going to be forty five thousand dollars but actually no households at all earn that $45,000. The households either earn zero or 90. So we commit an ecological fallacy if we assume that any individuals within an aggregated zone actually have the summary level characteristics of the zone that that individual resides in. 